welcome to this week's Scots and Us Spotlight on the upcoming Bonhams Scottish Fine and Decorative Arts and Silver Auctions, taking place on October 19th and 20th. Let us now join Camilla Hellman, President of the American Scottish Foundation, in conversation with Mae Matthews, Specialist in Scottish Art, and Gordon McFarlane, Specialist in Silver at Bonhams Edinburgh. We're delighted to be speaking with Mae Matthews, Head of Picture Department Scotland, and managing directors of Bonham Scotland of their upcoming sale in Edinburgh on the 19th of October, when a collection of 12 important works by George Leslie Hunter will be sold as part of their upcoming Scottish art sale. The paintings in the collection of his cousin, Arthur Layden, who died in, in 1968, are testament to the remarkable artistic journey of Hunter. Each picture has a unique place and story to tell. And so let me turn now to May to tell us more. Good morning, May. Good morning, Camilla. Thank you so much for inviting me along. It's an incredibly special collection and we're delighted and honoured to um, be handling the sale for the family. It's probably useful if I give your membership a little um, summary of what we mean by when we uh, call these artists the Scottish colourists. It's a term you may be familiar with, but it's probably worth a little recap. So the colourists are four artists, um, Samuel John Peplow, George Leslie Hunter, Francis Caddell and John Duncan Ferguson. And they're a set of radical artists who enlivened the Scottish art scene uh, with this fresh vibrancy of the French fauvist colours. Um, now, the name suggests they were a close-knit group with a specific set of a uh, aims, but actually that's not the case. They only exhibited three times together. Um, and the first time this term uh, Scottish colourist is used is in the 1950s by TJ Honeyman. Um, and then they actually add on Ferguson in, in the 1980s. So it's a very important group of artists, but they themselves did not see themselves as a group. But as auctioneers, I am thrilled when I pick up the phone call or I open my emails and somebody says they have a colorist picture they'd like to sell or even if you know they just want to have it valued for whatever real reason it's a real treat for me so when I received an email saying there's an entire collection of one of these colorists that had never been on the market before you know I was absolutely over the moon it's it's one of those dream um, inquiries that come through so for us it's delight to have them at Bonhams what makes it even more special is that they're not very well known, this particular collection. Um, they, two of them appeared on a TV documentary once and one was illustrated in the book. But apart from that, they've never been seen by anybody else. So um, again, incredibly exciting. And the other special thing about this is it's a really beautiful range right throughout his career. And it's really is a story of um, appreciation between two cousins. So George Leslie Hunter had a cousin called Arthur Layden and Arthur supports him throughout his career. And what remains is a treasured collection that is really exciting for me to work with and research. So we'll start chronologically at the beginning and the um, listeners can see the images hopefully on their screen at the same time. So the first one, the earliest example we have um, from this lovely collection is a street scene in Paris. It's probably dating to 1907, um, very early in his career. And again, this is the first time that we see his strong draftsmanship coming through. Before 1907, George Leslie Hunter actually spends most of his time drawing and working in San Francisco. He emigrated with his family um, previously and was working and setting up his career. But tragically, the night before the opening show of his solo exhibition, the earthquake strikes. I mean, it really is stuff of, of a movie script and his entire work is wiped out in one go. Um, and he decides that it's too painful to stay in San Francisco. He'll come back to Scotland, regroup and start his career again. Whilst he's here in Scotland, he travels to Paris and this is where this first sketch comes from. So early hunters are incredibly rare. Occasionally they do come up in San Francisco and California, but um, not very often. So this beautiful sketch is a really lovely example of this early period. Uh, it's got lovely harmony and mood and texture, and it's a hint of what will come in his career. Then the next painting we see is uh, one of my favorites. It's called Tulips, and it's an oil on canvas. 
And here, um, this is really a lovely example where Arthur is supporting George. He really is struggling to make ends meet. So a great cousin to come in and buy a painting to keep him going because it's another three years until Hunter has his first solo career in um, solo exhibition in Scotland so it's a sort of a, a drought period for him he's come back from America he's trying to establish himself in Britain luckily his cousin steps forward and buys a painting and helps him out um, but it really is um, a wonderful example of how the simple shape and direct presence of this vase and flowers um, is I think it animates the flowers and it gives a natural state and ultimately produces a still life elevated beyond the ordinary for this time in, in Scottish art. It's exquisite. The third pitch we have is another lovely um, example of a tonal masterpiece. It's called Trees. Um, very rare again to have this from this period. This is before he has his first solo exhibition. And really we see a very strong influence of um, Edward Manet in his work. So the tone and the palette um, are similar as is in the animation and the application of the opaque brush strokes. Um, similar to the tulips, but instead of the sweeping brush strokes, we have a sort of shorter or stippled effect. So, um, it's a lovely painting, but also it's, it's incredibly important for the whole development of Scottish art and I argue British art. Really, it is only people like Hunter who was doing this at this stage. Um, again, thankfully to his cousin Arthur, we have it remaining. These little sweet little paintings, you know, were quite often overlooked in, in art history and, and auctioneers prior to the colourists becoming the established group of artists they are today. What are we talking about for his early works? What is the price estimates on these? The little Parisian sketch is only three to five thousand. Um, tulips is twenty to thirty thousand, and trees is ten to fifteen thousand. Um, but if you ask me, you know, find a really lovely, exquisite example of a Manet. Um, what price are we looking at? Um, but because this is a Scottish artist. It's, it's more affordable in um, quotation marks. Um, I think incredibly important. You see them in lots of the well big known institutions around the world, but I still think there's much more work to be done in terms of waving the flag for George Leslie Hunter and really proving why he is considered such an important artist. But his work, art. as you said, has not really been um, shown this collection was in private hands and rarely seen so yeah, it yeah. really um, it, it will be interesting to see um, the reception because this is such a wonderful rare example so yeah, yeah. And, and some of the works you're going to talk about in a moment really do look as if they will be commanding quite large amounts as well but there are yes. some smaller sketches that we one could look at as an entry point. Yes, exactly. So you'll notice as we go towards uh, through the career, the big expensive still lives at the end, rightly so, have higher price tags. We go right up to eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand um, with the commanding still life that we'll talk about at the end, um, and that really reflects the importance and. Uh, he was well established at that point in his career and like all artists there's you know prices follow how successful they, they were so yes it's a great example of as you say an entry point into this wonderful world of colorists um, but for me you know they're, they're just beautiful um, as well as being slightly more affordable compared to the, the larger still lives really beautiful classy exquisite paintings we're now in the early 1920s? We're not quite there yet, sort of 1913 to 1918. He All still right. hasn't, had the big, hasn't hit the big time um, and he's trying to uh, experiment with portraiture. Now there's a misconception that Hunter doesn't get going with portraiture right until the last two years of his life, but that actually that's incorrect. He was trying it out much earlier and actually very successfully, but he was struggling to find sitters. So if you can't find a sitter, who do you ask? Your friend or your family, because they're the people around you. So we've got a lovely example here of a portrait of Arthur Layden himself. 
um, this was actually one of the, the favourite pictures of the family. Um, and it's a very commanding pose he has, but it's very, very modern in its tone. Um, there's an increasingly adept use of fluid brushwork and colour to build form and contours and ultimately personality. Uh, there's no denying that Arthur's expression is confident, interested and engaged in his cousin's art. And then very interestingly, probably less commercial, but I think um, an interesting picture is Man in White Rough. And this is actually um, a, another cousin. This is John. This is Arthur's brother. And I was a bit puzzled when I went to see this collection and I viewed it because it's big the sort of theatrical rough and I thought mm, what is that what, what's going on there um, and Bonhams have uh, consulted the preeminent expert on this artist a lady called Jill Mariner and her in-depth research has thrown up so many great facts about this collection um, including the fact that John actually had um, a neurological disorder that led to spinal cord damage so perhaps one of these ideas is that this rough is actually helping support keep his neck up but you know the artist is not thinking that's the most beautiful thing to paint so creates an imaginary rough a theatrical rough maybe he's turning it into a, a character from a play that he once saw so you know little gems of information like that incredibly interesting but also you only get that if you know the collection know the family and there's a an expert in the field who's done a lot of research on it so we're sort of marrying up this great world of commercial historical and sort of archive work all together so it's been a real joy to work on and probably another one of these quirky little stories that come out of it is we'll move on to a from 1914 now this is um, a well-known period in Hunter's life where he's moving to France back and forth quite regularly and in 1913, 1914 he goes back and he wants to have another painting trip. He invites his cousin along but actually obviously we all know what happens in 1914, World War II breaks out. So very sensibly Arthur Lydon says I don't think it's worth traveling to France right now, I'll stay back but Hunter no gung-ho he still goes for it but he gets in a bit of um, a spot of trouble and slightly sort of maybe overzealous police at the time in France don't like the look of this curious character jotting down lots of bits of information and tiny little bits of paper and sketches etc. Um, he's obviously Hunter's blonde, he's slightly pale looking, so you see where this is going. They arrest him and accuse him of being a spy um, and he gets taken to the local police station and as they're checking out his credential, Hunter actually panics and makes a dash for it and and escapes back to Paris. Um, but, you know, just another great story that's come off the back of um, the research about this artist and the, and the family connections. So it's interesting in terms of art history. It's very uh, Cezanne inspired, the technique he's using here. It's a patchwork of colour um, against the, you know, landscapes, hills and, and roofs. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to have this second secondary layer, this fun we know what's happening in Hunter's life at the time. And this then leads on to still life with Melon, which is the first time we really see this bold use of colour. And for Hunter, he has a deeper understanding of colour, I think, and also Jill Mariner thinks, compared to the other colourists. He's really looking at it from a philosophical side as well as an aesthetic side. So he understood that colour was a sensation of the eye rather than just colour of an object and this is beginning to take form in Hunter's work. It di differentiates him from the other colourists and probably makes him the most exciting of the group, um, misunderstood and maybe underappreciated as well. So an incredibly important um, painting, that one has a it's wee bit bowed, it's, it's, it's been in a family home for a while so a bit of TLC and that would look stunning, it really could be a museum quality painting yet it has an estimate of eight to 12,000. So, and then this leads us into the work that Hunter is well known for, we see more often. We've got the two little sweet gems of um, panels, landscapes in, in Fife, um, very familiar territory for us as uh, Scottish art valuers, these sweet little um, landscapes, lovely examples of those. Anybody can find room for that on their walls. Even collectors say, my, my walls are full. No, there's room for one more. <laughs> uh, and then it leads us into the big showstoppers. We have three big still lives. 
and this is really um, the where the the bulk of the value monetary value lies so we have still life with roses and japanese print um, lots of scottish artists and european artists at the time are very interested in what's happening with japan um, with their art and their culture lovely incredibly um rare example there so you really didn't sell them very often these only went to friends and family so to have this one is, is very special um, we have the stunning blue teacup which is painted sort of circa 1928-29 e hunters had a great successful career and he decides now's the time to launch into having a solo exhibition back in in america so um, by late 1928 he's feeling confident enough to organize a show in New York. His cousin, Arthur Layden, is actually living and working in New York. He is the sole trader for a linoleum company because he's got a great address in New York, lovely apartment. So yet again, he falls into the supportive role, supportive cousin. So Hunter takes his best work from his per this period and starts sending it over to Arthur and Arthur starts storing it for him. Arthur then moves over. He lives with, with his cousin and his family for six months and he's addicted to art, there's no doubt about it, and can't help but paint when he's staying with the family. So this is when these last two still lives actually come from. They didn't come from the exhibition, they came from when Hunter was living with them. Really special paintings. Blue Teacup I think is absolutely world class. Um, it's a, a masterclass really in, in what Hunter could do. Um, it's so inspired by what's happening in French art at the time. And again, if you can't afford one of the famous big names in French art, this is just as good in my opinion. And then the last example of the still life we have is this wonderful still life with candlestick. And in fact, this is one of the family's favorite paintings. Again, painted when Hunter was living with them in New York for those six months. Beautiful, bright use of colors, very interesting composition with this candle ever so slightly off center. Lovely silver basket full of fruit. And in fact, the family kept those items, the silver basket and the candlestick and still have them today, very much part of the story. So for me to go and view this painting in person and see the objects that Hunter touched and arranged, you know, was incredibly special, a really wonderful um, a moment for me as, a, as an art valuer. So that's the collection, a whole uh, sort of a, a quick gambit right through Hunter's career, um, something for everybody. But even if you're not a bio collector, please have a look at the sale online because the images themselves are very interesting. Each painting has a really detailed footnote. Everything's much more eloquently put than it is today <laughs> um, with some really interesting sort of academic side notes as well in there. It's lovely, it's lovely hearing of the support and story around his family being a part of this journey and yes. understanding his talent from early on and saying, you know, you're going to keep going, you know, and I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, in fact, he, Hunter had a large family um, and you can see it throughout actually various different branches um, with different cousins, etc, supporting him. So uh, this is one that we knew was possibly out there somewhere, but other have come to light. So yes, it's always intriguing to know how many more collections like this could be out there. So um, you this wonderful collection of 12 paintings is a is there one or two that are very special to you? You seem very drawn to the ones from um, the early sketches um, yes. or to the ones yeah. from Paris. I mean, I think the blue teacup is an absolute stunning painting. There's no denying it, incredibly special. But, you know, I'm a lady of modest tastes. And I would say, you know, what, would I, what could I put into my, my living room that wouldn't look out of place and I could really love and treasure forevermore? And that would probably be mm, tulips or trees, just very subtly done, just exquisite little gems. Mm -hmm. And it's not difficult to, to bid to go on to register with you and to then be a part of the auction online. 
Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. Um, Anybody can actually watch a Bonhams auction online. You don't have to register to bid. Obviously, in an ideal situation, you do and you are interested. But yeah, if you go to the bonhams.com website, you can see all of our forthcoming auctions listed. Click on the one you like the look of and scroll through and then click on those individual images. We'll get even more information. If you want to ask a specialist a question, there's a helpful button right there. If you want to talk to someone in customer services, how I can you know, complete the process. But um, unsurprisingly, we make it relatively easy to hold your hand and walk you through the process. Well, but there has never been a better time for us in America to be thinking about buying, um, you know, antiques and, um, and art, because with this exchange rate as it is, it's a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, it's certainly a fact, and, we, and we've been seeing <laughs> that already. So, yeah, it's, it's a good time. And also, you know, the world is much more connected these days, shipping, etc. We have a great, great shipping department here we can put you in touch with. So it is um, a, a process that should be accessible to all. And, you know, we're a friendly bunch of people who will talk you through it. And but you make please... it very easy for us. Yes, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, service with a smile, and I think <laughs> all, all things done with a with a good with a good manners. It, yeah, but it's, it's um, easy. Now, to also as a final point, if you you have a painting that you are intrigued by, um, you are very up for hearing from that person if they're looking to sell it and to help them through that, and you do offer that service too. Yeah, absolutely. So anybody can email me. Um, just take a photograph on your phone of the painting, measuring tape out, give me an idea of size, and I will let you know it's a free complimentary service. I'm quite a nosy person. I just love seeing what people have in their homes and it has been in their family for a long time. So that's what we're here for. We're here to in receive inquiries, even if it's something you just want to know a bit more information about. Um, it's it's non-obligationary process. And yeah, I'm very happy to have a look at anything Scottish art related, even if it's not Scottish, I can always ping it on to somebody in the in the business who does know we've got so many specialist departments um, all around the world so the great thing is if I don't know about a painting I know somebody who will know the answer so. well, thank you for taking the time today to help us through this and to make us aware the sale is on October the 19th on the Scottish Art Sale with Bonham's Edinburgh and so uh, we're going to put all the information at the bottom of the screen and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Wonderful. Thank you, Camilla. So following the Scottish art sale on October 19th, Bonhams Edinburgh turned their attention to their Scottish decorative art sale, which will take place on October 20th. Gordon McFarlane, who heads up Bonhams Edinburgh Silver Department, now joins me to tell us of some of the wonderful pieces that are coming up from, wonder, from renowned silversmiths, several pieces dating back to the 1700s. Gordon is a director of Bonhams with his specialty in silver and a love of silver from everything I hear, Gordon. Good morning. Good morning, Camilla. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, uh, the, the, the Scottish sale, as, as I think you, you know, has been running for over 20 years now, we always have a substantial Scottish silver component because it's really, it's a very strong tradition in, in, in Scotland dating back to, um, you know, the, the sort of 16th century. Of course, it's, it's very rare for such early pieces to, to come on the market um, because what happens is in, in times of, of, of need, they tend to be melted down and, 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 and sort of cashed in. But if, if, if you ask me, is there such a thing as Scottish silver? In, in, insofar as does it have a distinctive style and distinctive types, then, then very much yes. And we have a few pieces here which we can uh, sort of demonstrate that with. Uh, the, probably the most familiar one and, and the most well-known is, is the quake. And yes. we have a very fine example here dating probably from 1720 or so. And at this date, and, and the quake started out as a, a wooden vessel. Quake maker was a, a, an established trade, and uh, these were turned on a lathe, and, and th in this case, made from segments of laburnum wood, often known as the, the sort of Scottish mahogany. 
Um, that'd be then passed on to the, the, the goldsmith. Um, silversmith is purely a 19th century term. And the, the two lugs have been um, encased in silver and also a, a, a boss in the middle, a little sort of silver badge, which has two sets of initials. I'll just read them out, JG over MF. Now, the reason why you get two sets of initials is um, traditionally in, in Scotland, um, on the occasion of a marriage, and this is uh, almost certainly commemorating a marriage, um, the lady kept her maiden name, um, unlike in England. And uh, even on my walk home from the, the, the train station, I walked through a graveyard, that tradition um, extended even up until the 1880s. So here we have um, JJ, so it might have been James Johnson marrying Margaret Ferrier, um, but Margaret Ferrier would keep her own name and that's um, recognized in, in the, the way their initials are engraved. Now, as, as time went on and um, there was more money in Scotland, what had been a traditional wooden vessel um, came to be made in, in solid silver. And we have a very fine example here. Again, we, we only have a maker's mark, so we don't know um, the exact year of manufacture, but probably 1720s or so. And I don't know whether you can see it, but, um, although it um, follows very closely the, the form of the wooden quake, uh, there are engraved lines running vertically right round the piece, like the segments of an orange, and that reflects the original construction of, of the wooden quake. And uh, quakes have been in continual production for the last sort of 350 years or so. Um, we have various examples here. There's a little one made in the, the 1830s, just as a, a personal gift. Um, it's sort of chased in, in relief with some game birds. And uh, that one probably for use, use for, for sort of drinking whiskey rather than ale for the, the, the larger example. Would be, so the larger one would have been for yeah, ale or something? Yes, it's much, much too large for whiskey, which in fact was, was a rather sort of coarse drink. I mean, the, the, when we think of whiskey in an 18th century context, we're really talking about sort of um, individual stills producing raw spirit. The whole tradition of um, aged single malts, um, which cost a lot of money and are laid down for 20 years, uh, and are, are sort of admired the world over. That's really just a sort of 19th century innovation. So um, what S Scottish gentlemen drank in the 18th century was principally claret. So this was, could be used for, for, for um, consumption of claret or, or beer or ale. So that's, uh, and one, before I forget, when you say the marks, you know, we know that, they, that, that there's a mark for who the maker was. Yes. Was there a mark? for Edinburgh or where it was being assayed? Yeah, there has been since the sort of, um, since the 15th century, yes. Is there still an assay office in Edinburgh? There is, yes. And, uh, the, and there was for um, 150 years, there was also one in Glasgow between 1819 and 1964. But those were the only two official assay offices. But silver was made throughout Scotland in all the, the, the large and small towns. And there is um, and anything made outside Glasgow and Edinburgh comes under the, the, the category of provincial silver. And that's a whole collecting area in itself. And uh, of course, there's a hierarchy of rarity because there, it, it won't surprise you to hear there are more silversmiths active in Aberdeen than there were in, in a tiny place like Wick, for instance. And so there, there, there's a hierarchy of, of des rarity and desirability. So in the first tier, you have sort of Aberdeen, Perth, and Dundee. On the second tier, Inverness, Paisley, perhaps. But the very rarest mark of all, and we're very lucky to have an example here, is Stonehaven. Now, this, this is a single teaspoon. Yes. Now... As far as anyone knows, in the entire world, there are, I think there are five recorded pieces of Stonehaven made silver, and this is one of them. Um, so as a result, it's a fairly expensive teaspoon. We expect this to fetch something between probably two and a half and possibly 3,000 pounds for a single teaspoon. 
And that's a fiddle. It, it's a fiddle pattern teaspoon. It does have the maker's mark on the back. Um, Alexander Glenny. And uh, really it's an approximation of the spelling of Stonehaven. They're only, they've missed out the, the Avon bit at the end. The, the, the end. So it's S-T um, O-V and the N at the end, there's a couple of letters missing. But that, that's an extreme rarity. It doesn't mean to say that um, there were, of course, wealthy people in, in, in Stonehaven, but the anyone who, the landed gentry who lived in that area, they would patronize um, Edinburgh or possibly even London um, goldsmiths and silversmiths. So a, a little teaspoon like this, probably made in a set of six would be for the local doctor or, 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 or minister, something like that, but a very great rarity. But um, beautiful workmanship. That's yes, yeah. But these items, when you see them uh, up close, it, 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 it is still beautifully made. But if I give you a sense of, of, of context, um, this dates from probably around about 1830 or so. Now, you can still buy an 1830 um, Edinburgh or Glasgow made teaspoon for 10 or 15 pounds. And this is two and a half or 3,000 pounds. So, um, a, a bit like the gas supply, we are subject to the laws of, of uh, supply and demand and that dictates the prices, of so course. Under, so when we go foraging, we need to be looking for those marks. Yes. Be aware of them. E exactly. And of course, this, has, this spoon has never been officially assayed. It was only marked by the maker. It's never been subjected to the official um, government um, regulated assay process in, in the Edinburgh assay office. They were supposed to, all the makers in the provinces were supposed to send things to Edinburgh. Very often it didn't happen. Um, so that's the, one of the smallest spoons in the sale to, to, to the largest one. And, and this fantastic thing here um, is, it's what's known in Scotland as a hash spoon. And, and so it's a serving spoon. Um, it's a very big serving spoon. It is very big. And, and if you ask me why it's a very big serving spoon, I'd struggle to, to answer that because no one really knows. I mean, ser serving spoons in, in uh, mid 18th century Scotland, and this one was made by the firm of, of Lothian and Robertson in 1764, I think. Um, the, the bowl, well, the whole thing is approximately double the size of the equivalent English serving spoon of the period. And the, the, oddly, the same thing applies for tea, to teapots. Tea, Scottish teapots are, are, in the 18th century, are routinely significantly larger than, than the equivalent English ones. Um, it wasn't as wealthy a country, but maybe we're just a bit greedier and, and, and preferred larger helpings in, in, in Scotland. Well, but, maybe that was, would that have been for the stew or for something? Yes, I mean, it, it, exactly that's true. I mean, there were separate soup ladles. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a soup ladle, it'd be for... For, no, not a soup. No. For, for, for stew, I think, yeah. And um, the, the owner, the original owner's initial, at M, so it could be anyone, uh, Mackenzie, McFarlane, um, half of Scotland has a surname beginning with M, so don't really... <laughs> and, but you, you notice that it's engraved on what we now regard as the back of the spoon. And that's because in the mid 18th century, um, when you're laying a table, you'd place the spoon in what we regard as upside down, but that was the right way around at that period. And uh, here, here the, the hallmarks are on the stem, quite near the bowl. And this is what's known as a bottom struck um, spoon. Because um, what happened was, well, there was a sent off to the assay office. Um, the hallmarks would be struck and they'd spread the stem. And once it got back to the maker, he'd have to hammer it back into shape. So sometimes, as here, they're a little bit squashed. So after about 1770, they, they realized this is a problem and the marks migrated from um, the bottom of the stem right up to near the top. So it's another easy way of dating, um, dating an 18th century spoon. But that's really quite a splendid example. And that has an estimate of what? Uh, I think that's um, 12 to 1500 pounds. So it's it's half the half the value of of, of, of the Stonehaven spoon. <laughs> um, what else do we have? Yeah. Um, what is the little orb beside you, almost the, the by your hand? This? No, it's by your hand. That. Ah, yes. 
This, that, that's a tea caddy. Beautiful. Uh, this, it's almost entirely undecorated. There are a, a couple of lines of, of reeded decoration. Um, it, it, it opens um, at the top and the bottom. But if I go like that, you can see it's of, of, of a, a novel shape. So it, it really fits into the neoclassical repertoire of shapes. Um, and of course, the most famous neoclassical architect, architect of all was a Scotsman, Robert Adam. So um, he sort of um, established the, the, the fashion for classically inspired um, silver, of which this is a, a good example. The fact that it is a tea caddy means it's, it's, I hesitate to use the word rare. I think it's an overused word, but it is scarce because I think you probably only would find one silver tea caddy for every 50 teapots. A teapot was more of an essential. Yes. Um, but only the only people with a bit more disposable income would be able to afford a, a silver tea caddy. And you notice it has a lock. Well, so also this, that was so it was so um, precious. Tea was yes. a very and, precious thing. Yeah, because the, the reason why it has a lock is so you'd lock up the contents and. The, the danger was that your servants would, would, would pinch your tea, of course. That, that was what we're protecting against. It, there wasn't sort of um, danger of burglary. So that's made in, I think, yeah, 1793 or 1796 by the partnership of William and Patrick Cunningham. But, but beautifully pure form. And this really, this is a consistent design feature in, in, in Scottish silver. You find articles which have hardly any decoration at all. And what they're relying on for, for the, the, to express beauty is really the, the substance itself, just a, a, a smooth expanse of, of, of silver, which is a really lovely sight in, in, in itself. The only decoration is, is, is a family crest and it's the family of Maitland. So there's a, a, a sort of demi, a demi lion holding a, a sword and a motto above, a family motto, and the, the very fact that the motto appears above the crest rather than below it, that is also a Scottish feature. So I have to ask, inside the tea caddy, did it just take one tea or has it got a petition? Ah, well, you, you, you're very well informed. This only has one compartment. So you're referring to the tradition of having compartments for both black and green tea, uh, but not in this instance. Of course, at the time, in the 18th century, they thought they were came from different botanical species. In fact, they're, they're exactly the same, just one was, ferme one was, was fermented tea and one, one was simply dried rather than fermented. But uh, no, it's quite commonplace to, to find wooden tea caddies or even sets of tea caddies. There, there may have been two of, of these, one for green and one for black. Yes, um, but that but is gorgeous. It is, it is a rather lovely thing. And so what would be one of your favorite pieces that's in the sale? Is okay, that what well, you have in your hands there? When, when you're in my position and you, you have to sort of uh, look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces per year, when something really exceptional comes along, it really does make you stop and think. And, and this is an exceptional set. There are three things here. There's a, a, a punch bowl, well, the oh. most remarkable raised that, um, yeah. fruiting vine along the, the rim and also the base, um, a matching punch ladle, all in silver. Normally the handles are wood, but this is all in silver. And a strainer with gorgeous sort of large shaped handles. But the, the astonishing thing here is it's really sharp. It looks as though it might've been made last week. I mean, I don't think this is, it's a presentation set. It was given to a magistrate in the 1820s, a chap called um, Robert Hood and uh, given to him by a, a series of clients in, in gratitude for his, his hard work. And I suspect this has never been probably used a, a few times in its life, but because normally silver, which is 190 years old, shows considerable signs of wear. This is absolutely pristine. Um, so you have sort of chase thistles, and roses, um, his family crest, and the lovely sort of neoclassical beaded edge. I mean, it's just the most sumptuous thing. It's like a gigantic piece of jewelry.
or the strainer for the very large teapot. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. So, and, and it's a functional thing. You could actually buy this and, and, and give very um, agreeable parties and make your own punch. I mean, what, what this was intended for would be um, rum or, or whiskey punch, um, which is made with, with um, usually either rum or whiskey, hot water, and, and lemons. This is a lemon strainer. And then you'd, you'd dish it out in individual glasses with this, this very smart punch ladle. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. So it, it's, it's not necessarily the most valuable thing this sale, but it really is rather special. And when you say it's not the most valuable, how, uh, where do you estimate that being? I think that's th three to 5,000 for the set. It's stunning. It, it is, and, and uh, if, if you went to try and get someone to make that now, they'd ask you an awful lot more than that. I know. It, 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 it rep must represent hundreds of man hours in, in, in manufacture, I think. So is there also a reference for all the different, just say, stamps? Um, are there, how can we look these up and know more about the Silversmiths of Scotland? Yes, I mean, there, there, there are various books, and, and, and these days everything's online. You can actually, if, if you just um, in, 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 enter into your favourite search engine, Edinburgh Silver Makers Marks, they're all um, recorded from the sort of 1450s onwards. It's, wow. uh, it's a lot easier to look things up than it used to be 20 years ago. <laughs> a good magnifying glass, too. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So Wonderful. Have you got anything else to finish up with? I, I have. I mean, um, what do we have here? Um, yes, somebody a little bit out of the ordinary. These are two rather odd looking, um, well, a ladle and a spoon. This, this is a, a quite a simple looking ladle and the, the handle is formed as a dolphin. Oh. Now that, that, that is not obviously Scottish, but there is a very strong Scottish link here because that's an exact replica of a piece of Roman silver found in Scotland in the 1920s, about 10 miles from where I'm sitting on, on top of a hill called Traprain Law. I mean, Law is the old Scots name for, for hill. And so it was found that this hoard of Roman silver, um, several hundred pieces, was found in the 20s and it was, it was a sensation at the time and uh, a, a local prominent goldsmith, Brook and Son, negotiated with the National, what became the National Museum to produce perfect replicas. And Brook paid a, a royalty, a small sum of money for each replica of, of the Roman hoard produced. And so there are large there are dishes and, and, and various things, but th these are rather appealing, it's a nice ladle. It's, it's a little bit useless actually for, for, um, for, for modern day life, but I, I think people were interested in the history and, and uh, you know, even extending back to the Roman history of, of, of um, silver manufacture in, in Scotland. And here's a, a, an archetypal Roman spoon, also part of the, the Traprain board. If someone is interested in any um, piece in the sale, whether it's a, a piece of silver or, or not, there are a number of ways they can get in touch. There's a phone number on our website. You can send an email. Um, or you can apply online for a, a condition report and, and we will have a look at the piece, um, tell you any the, the good points and, and the not so good points and even if necessary, send additional photographs. And, and these days, um, clients very often like to see the back of the piece, inside the piece, underneath the piece and all of that we, we, we can do. And I when it, it comes... When it comes to bidding, you you, okay. you, you can bid either on um, online on uh, by telephone or, or or leaving a bid in advance. So I uh, and the sale, apart from the wonderful spoons and quakes we've just seen, has a wide array of silver items in the 120 it, plus. It has, I think, there's 111 items of silver, as as well as other Scottish items, and there's Jacobite glass pieces of furniture, um, all, all manner of things. So thank you so much for joining okay, pleasure. us today. This has been fun. So Good. this is a once a year sale? It is, yes, yes. And so you're always looking for interesting pieces of silver for the next sale? Absolutely, yes. Yes, if I were depending on it. <laughs> All right. Well, this is good. So we have to yeah. tell everybody to take a look. 
thank you so much and talk to you shortly. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this week. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. To learn more about what the American Scottish Foundation does, please go to our website, americanscottishfoundation.org, and join us again the first and the third Monday of the month for another Scots in Us. Thank mm -hmm. you.